Okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Chris. This talk is titled 11 Tools for Your DevOps Stack. It used to be seven that I started counting, and over the last months there have been some additions and some tools that disappeared. So um, today it's 11. Um, if somebody can actually, at the end of the talk, remember all of seven of them, great. Um, do I still need to show this slide here? <laughs> for a couple of people, probably not. For a couple of others, I'll go over it. So my name is Chris Batert. Um I started my career over 15 years ago actually doing software development. I wrote code in all kinds of crappy languages like Perl, Bash, C, Java. Um, I was always the guy who was writing the code, then putting it on machines, then racking those machines and putting them uh, in production, putting the firewalls in front of them. And basically, I, I became an operations guy um, because I had to, because I had to learn how to do this stuff. Um, my daily role is I'm the what we like to call the chief trolling officer. And some of my colleagues call me the chief travel officer, although they travel more than I do, at Inuits. And Inuits is an open source company um, mainly focused in the Benelux. We have offices in uh, Antwerp and Dordrecht, uh, but also in, uh, in Kiev. And we basically help customers to use open source tools to achieve their own goals. Um, and you might remember me from my blog, which is titled, Everything is a fucking DNS problem, which it actually is. So, this talk is titled seven, no, 11 tools for your DevOps stack. So, what is this DevOps thing? Who knows? Apart from Kuhn, apart, yeah, some people know. So, but not everybody knows, so let me explain. As you might know, I've been going to a lot of conferences over the past almost a decade. I ran into a lot of people and I've been talking to them about how do you deploy software? How do you manage software? How do you scale software? and how do you keep it running at a reasonable speed. So I get to interact with a lot of people, both people writing software and both people managing software and monitoring it. And I was really frequently running into a bunch of people listed on top, like Patrick, Gildas, um, Julian Simpson, um, Lindsay, John Willis, who was here also a couple of years ago, uh, John Kinnies, all those people, and we were always talking about the same problems, the same tools, the same ideas on how do you manage and deploy software? How do you get the teams that are doing this, which used to be different teams, how do you get them closer together? And back in the US, there was a conference called Velocity, which was actually two conferences in one. It was a web operations conference, like how do you manage Flickr, how do you deploy this stuff? And on the other side, it was a web performance conference targeted at people doing front-end development. How do you optimize your JavaScript code? How do you improve your style sheet so that actually the pages load faster? And they were bridging those gaps. So sometime in 2009, Patrick Dubois and I were talking at a conference in Antwerp, and we basically decided, well, let, let's do this thing. Let's organize yet another conference, and Patrick called it DevOps Days, and he was influenced by pretty much all of the people on top to actually do it. And that's how DevOps days came to a point. And as you can see, there have been a lot of them. Um, we have a couple of them in the States. We had one in Rome um, earlier this one. And the format of that conference is that in the morning we have three, four formal talks, like over here. Then we have some lightning talks, Ignite, basically 20 slides out of forwarding every five seconds. And in the afternoon, we have open spaces where people actually get to sit together, discuss their problems, discuss, discuss their ideas, and share their experiences. And that format is something that people really like. But we are talking about how do you bridge the gap between development and operations people. So if you want to define DevOps, the best definition we have today is it's, it's a cultural and professional movement of people discussing the same pains. Uh, we don't have all the answers yet. We are reaching out to different communities. For example, in Munich in August, the Drupal community organized a full track on DevOps. How do you deal with Drupal and operations? Uh, there are different Ruby conferences that have done the same. There are Java conferences that have been doing the same. They're trying to get the people deploying their software involved into the discussion. So there's pretty much, if you look at technology, there's nothing new at what we do. Yes, there's a bunch of new tools, but it still is a growing movement with 
which talks about tools, about practices, about how do you do this stuff. And we're still looking for some problems to be solved. So, well, that's not really a definition, right? So let me give you a real one. So, who knows this text? Who has read something similar? Nobody. Who does not agree with this? <laughs> you don't agree with it because there's too much text on it? No, this is like the wording is like we're in a new econ economic age and all of this crap is like this has nothing to do with DevOps. Eh, it's not. But it's basically because it's an ancient text. There's nothing new in this, but all the points in there basically apply to best practices. How do you do? How do you run an organization? How do you improve the organization? And this is ancient. This is what Deming wrote in 1986. And the funny thing is if you put this list up at DevOps days discussions and people go over it and you don't tell them it's Deming, they won't know. And then you tell them, well, guys, this is 20 year old. Uh, this is 25 year old. Yeah, so there's nothing new. If you really want to explain to somebody easily what DevOps is, you can basically cut it down to four parts. It's about culture, it's about automation, it's about measurement, and it's about sharing. And that's what John Edwards and uh, John, Damon Edwards and John Willis, oh, they will kill me for this, <laughs> mix me up their names. Um, that's what they have been calling DevOps for a while. Now, John is actually, officially retiring the C out of DevOps. He doesn't think it's about culture anymore. Although we try to organize the whole Rome edition being about culture, he, he doesn't think it's about culture anymore. It's not about how do you do, how do you treat people, how do you work together. What we feel is that it has been way too much about the automation part, about the measuring part, about the technology. And that's something we, well, there's a room for that discussion, but it is still about how do you treat people, how do you work together. So let's talk a bit about that culture. Um, this is how traditionally development and operations people were working together. They were throwing mud at each other, always finger pointing like, yeah, you broke this, no, you broke this. Why are you using so many memory? Why are you writing out log files in production? Why is this stuff just going out of memory every time? Well, it's Java, you know. Um, this is how Management looked at development versus operations. It's not a funny sight. But can you blame us? Can you blame the developers that they look at operations people like this? I mean, who has not read these books or extracts from them? Everybody's read them. That's the kind of image system people made up for themselves. We're the boss of the operator from hell. You need more disk space? What's your username? Yeah. So we kind of created that situation for ourselves. We kind of pushed ourselves into a situation where the targets were different. Developers have a goal set, and the goal set is deliver new stuff, make it sure that new features are in production. While the operations people, they have an opposite job. They have to keep stuff running, keep it stable, and everything out of the old idle days, everything they change is a risk which is completely bullshit, but that's how we've been trained to think. If you change something, you can break something. So the goal is to actually break down all the silos, break down the, the non-existing borders between people, because there, there are no borders. It's people who are trying to achieve the same goal. After all, the goal is to have a business operational, to get money. So your company gets money, so you can actually pay for the food of your children. And if you look at kindergarten, if you have small kids, the first couple of years, you see they all playing in their own corners. And they, they don't know how to play together. And when they grow up, they actually start playing together. And that's what an organization needs to do also. They need to have all the fun, but group it. And if you play together, it's much more fun. So why are organizations not doing that? 
because there are middle layers of management in between with people who know absolutely nothing about shit, not even about management, but just need to get their payroll at the end of the month. And for them, the number of people that are working for them is more important than the fact that their company is actually making revenue. And that's the kind of people we have to eliminate. And that means breaking the silos, having shared responsibilities. So there is a tool to do that. How do you get people to play together? How do you get people to actually bond? And how do you get them to come back the next day in the office and actually know each other and talk to each other about more stuff than, hey, you know, that script you just wrote? Well, it just totally broke down my system. I know situations where people working together don't even know about they have children, if they're married, because they don't talk about that stuff. They just know one thing, and that's he broke the system. So which tool do you use to improve that communication? What? Lunch, coffee? Lunch, coffee? With caramelic, maybe? <laughs> oh boy, I'm in the Netherlands. Yeah, exactly, beer, or wine, or any other drink. Basically, get people drunk. There's nothing better than coming into the office the next day with both with the same hangover, maybe not wanting to share the experiences you had before, so you have to talk about other stuff than you broke the platform. It, it's, it's a weird story, but it is one of the most important tools. Get people to socialize, organize, game evenings, organize hack weekends, but get people to do stuff outside of their regular day jobs and mix teams there. Go out for bowling, whatever, do social stuff. That's one of the biggest tools around. So, think about culture. Well, let's talk about automation. If you look at technology today, there's a lot of problems we've solved. We pretty much know how to automatically deploy 1,000 systems. We've got tools to do that. Kickstart Five. we use Preseed, we use Cobbler, whatever. There's plenty of tools there. We, well, <laughs> I tend to think that configuration management is a problem that has been solved to a level which is high enough, but still there's people around who think they really need to write other and other tools. I used to make the mistake of saying, well, don't write another configuration management tool. Um, until I actually had both John Alspaugh and um, Mark Berg was sitting in the audience. And then it's a bit awkward to say, don't try to run configuration management tool. But I think there's, there's reasons where people sometimes want to write other configuration management tool. You shouldn't be discussing which one. You shouldn't be discussing if you should use one. You should just be using one. And if it's Ansible or Puppet or Chev or CF Engine or something else, just use something so you can keep control of your platform. But I think configuration management pretty much is a solved problem. Now, there's a bunch of tools which have not been solved. There's one of the bigger problems is how do you release software coherently? How do you make sure that if you change one component, actually the software doesn't break because you don't change the other components? Build and release management. There's stuff like how do you package and how do you manage repositories, repositories of software that are tied together. How do you manage those? There's a bunch of tools that are still needed to do that. And there's, we have configuration management, we have high availability stuff, but what's still a growing need is tools that do orchestration. Like only shut down Apache on the servers with these, these, and these specifics. Those are tools where there's still room for improvement. And I'll talk about a few of them, how to solve that. So let's take a step back. What's the first thing you need to do if you are writing a piece of software? You need to use version control. You need to build something. What's the next step you want to do? Test. test. Thank God somebody says testing. I was fearing somebody was going to say, let's throw it in production. So to test software and to build software, there's a bunch of tools out there. And I'm a big fan of Jenkins. Jenkins, to me, is a tool. It's an open source, continuous integration server, which allows you to do everything commercial alternatives have been doing for ages. Jenkins used to be uh, Hudson in a previous life. Uh, it has a huge community around it. Some people abuse it as a 
distributed cron job. Um, some people abuse it for other reasons. But it's really a vibrant community that allows you to plug in any tool you want. It has over, well, 400 plugins. And they actually help a lot of open source projects. Um, we use it for different reasons. One of them is actually have developers build reproducible code, then execute that code and, and run a bunch of tests on that. But as an infrastructure guy, you can also use it to actually test and build your own infrastructure. So we use it, for example, to have uh, Puppet code validated and tested, and then test that code, actually. Um, for example, th this is a pipeline which we use, um, which is built using the pipeline plugin in Jenkins. And it's basically a set of things you want to do sequentially. And if the first one fails, you're never going to go to the end. So what we're doing here in this screenshot is, for example, first is a Git checkout. We check if all the submodules are in the Git repository, if we can actually all pull them. Um, then we do a bunch of syntax tests. Then we do a bunch of style text. Then we package the stuff. And then we actually deploy it onto a repository. And these things, you can easily write them in shell scripts. But then you don't version them. There's also, Jenkins also solves the problem that you want to get statistics on that. It also solves the problems of getting metrics on that. There's a bunch of plugins which help you there. So you can basically get an idea of how healthy your environment has been over the ages. How many bugs did you introduce during the course of the development? It actually helps you a lot to increase the stability of the code and to get fixes in there and bugs solved earlier than you go to production. So the last step in there is, oops, one back, is building a package and throwing that onto a repository. Now, besides Dach, who likes to build packages? Who likes to build packages? Oh, just sorry, didn't see you. <laughs> so besides that and Joss, who likes to build packages? For Debian, for Arc, for CentOS, for all of them. Who likes to get them upstream into a repository, into a distribution? Ah. Nobody. Packaging sucks. The problem with packaging is that packaging works for a certain distribution, but you need to have a different version of that library. And there's two ways. Either you build it yourself, or you fight half a year to get it into the distribution. And by time, your release slot has shifted, and you already need to be in production. Um, for example, you want to have some Java installed. Oh, there's half of X. Who needs half of X? Nobody. Um, did anybody read Maximum RPM completely? Does anybody besides Doug and Jules know all the ins and outs of spec files? Do you really want to spend your time doing that? I'm not. Um, I basically want to have a directory, which is the output of a build, and I want to package stuff. And I'm not the only one. There's a guy which name is going to be repeated a couple of times. Um, by the way, he's looking for articles for the upcoming Sys event, which is Jordan Cicel. And he has this thing which is called anger-driven development. If he's really frustrated about something, if he's really pissed about something, he writes a tool for it. And he calls it FPM. And the F stands for fucking package manager. Um, he built a tool which basically takes as input everything on the left-hand side and much more, because this is an old slide. RPM, NPM, takes a Ruby gem, takes a Python package, takes anything, a directory. And just parses it and throws it out as another package. Easy. Just one comment. FPM, T, I want an RPM, it's a directory, I want a package Hornet queue. Try packaging Java stuff. I mean, anybody like JPackage? Um, but I want to have version 2 to 5 of Hornet queue because that's what my developers need. And I can put this into a Jenkins job, which pulls out from the upstream Git repository, and I get daily builds of packages with one command line without having to fiddle with any kind of tool to build my spec files to write my rules. And if I change it to Debian, it's minus T deb. And that's it. It's that easy to build packages. Because one of the things which developers have been nagging to me about for ages is 
well, we have the Maven RPM plugin, but it doesn't work. Well, yeah. We had to discuss for agents, where do you put files, where do you do? Now you can sit together with the development and build them a package in 20 seconds. And when you sit together with the development, developer talking about where do you want to put files, where do those files belong, that's when you start creating a conversation. That's when you start bridging the gap. Because no longer you have to deal with Maven, which you don't understand, and explain them how to do it. No, you can just say, look, let's build a tree together. Let's do this together. And you'll be helping yourself by using a tool simple as that. Um, there's other use cases for FPM. We use FPM to build a full RubyGem repository. We have um, there's Jenkins plugins, not just plugins, and all that stuff. There's a, a, hub, a GitHub repository which you can fork if you put in a new version of a Ruby gem, you send us a pull request, Jenkins automatically picks it up, and five minutes later, it's on a public HTTP repository which you can use. Try doing that with spec files. You cannot beat the speed of doing that. Sure, those are packages which are almost never gonna be end up in a upstream distribution, but for 99% of the use cases, they will solve your problems. So that's the first time I have to mention Jordan, and well, he gets beer from me frequently, so. The next problem, yes. Does it build from source, or? Whatever you want. Does it build Windows packages? I don't know if Jordan was that angry. <laughs> Check the site, could be. He does weird stuff, so. I've never had that use case, so. But it could be, it could be it does, I don't know. I never had the question, I never had the use case, but. So another tool. Now, one of the use cases I've been running into is an environment with a lot of different servers. You come into the customer, and there's through three, four, five hundred servers. They have been managing all that stuff by hand, and they run into weird glitches on applications on 5% of their servers, and the other five don't have that. And the Java developers say, well, all the code is on the same level, so there's not a problem. And the system people, they're like, so what can we do to figure out what's different on all those platforms? And they wanted to have some kind of, well, distributed shell, but better. Um, they wanted to figure out what's installed on their servers. They wanted to figure out what's running on which server. And they basically wanted to send out one comment on the queue and let that comment be executed on different servers. And there's a tool for that. It's called mCollective, the Marionette Collective. It does orchestration. It figures out all those stuff, and there's a zillion plugins for that. And you can basically query your whole infrastructure and ask them, what's the next one? What is the status of Apache on these servers? Um, well, on all my UAT boxes, Apache is only running on this one, this one, a bunch of others. You, you get a clear view with one comment. Um, the next question you get is, well, so you tell me that all the Java code is on the same level, but what about the GDKs? Well, Java people told me back there they only had one version of Java running. Guess what? I, by using mCollective, by using the plugins, we had a tool where we could go to a developer and say, look, wh what do you think? You think? No, let's show. Let's actually measure. Let's actually count how many versions of Java you have running. Then the next step, obviously, is to align that and use the same tool by use package ensure, put it on the same version. So talked a bit about culture. We talked a bit about automation. Now let's talk about measurement. Who likes monitoring? <laughs> One guy. Three people like monitoring. If, if only three people like monitoring, monitoring must suck. It makes a lot of money. Hmm? It makes a lot of money. It makes a lot of money. So monitoring is awesome. Metrics is, are awesome. There are so many metrics you can capture. There's so many tools. And that's one of the problems John Vincent figured out. I think it's probably... It's, over a year ago when, yeah, well, no, June 2011, when he started on Twitter ranting about how monitoring sucks 
and how monitoring is not good and how all the existing tools suck, like the things he mentions, you, having to put in non-existing virtual host to actually have a Nagios check in place, having a good configuration tool to control all the configs, but not being able to do that at scale. Um, Marcel was talking about CheckMK. CheckMK is awesome for some reasons. And if you want to integrate it with configuration management tools, it becomes absolutely unusable crap. That kind of frustration. Like, it works, but it doesn't work. There's no tool which does stuff at scale. There's a bunch of tools which have an awesome GUI, but they don't work at scale. And the tools that work at scale, they don't have a GUI to show your management. So the fact that you have to capture metrics two or three times, one to measure them, once to put trending on there, and then another time to put alerting on there, there's no good tools out there. There's, there's not enough good choices. There's chaos. Um, there's a Git repository which tried to have a list of all existing monitoring tools. It's endless. And the weird thing is that we did a study, and I think I actually present Tom or I presented that study here, probably here like, which year did we do that? 2008? Yeah, so four years ago, I think we gave a talk about open source monitoring tools. And back then, we concluded that out of all the tools we had, there was basically only one that was usable. It was Nagios with Kinga maybe as the fork. Because that was the one where you could just generate a configuration using a config management tool and use any different front end you wanted. And three years later, people were still stuck on the same conclusion. There is a bunch of tools out there that make it easier, but it's still, you have to build something like this yourself. There, yeah, the picture is on GitHub, but say you have a Java application which you want to monitor. You are exposing it using JMX. You are using a tool like JMX Trans to actually send the metrics to a tool like Graphite, or to Ganglia, or to another time series database, RRD tool. So you get trends, you get analytics on how much Java space you're using, what, when you're going out of memory, all that stuff. Now, if you want to do alerting, you need to have a tool which takes the data and then sends that using Tattle or using uh, CheckJMX to Nagios. So you have Apache log files, which you want to parse to see how many people are contacting your site. Then you need a different tool. Get those tools, use them logstash, send them to Graphite, send them to Ganglia, send them to logstash, send them to any. Building this is it's fun. It's an engineering challenge. You have weeks of fun building this stuff. And I actually spend a lot of time building this stuff with all of these tools. But you have to put work in there. And you're still collecting a lot of metrics two or three times. So there's new methods. There's people thinking about how do we solve this. What we really want is to have a bunch of Unix-style tools do one thing, but do it really good, small, pipeable, chainable to each other, which are going to do metrics, which are going to transform stuff, put them on a queue, typically. We use Rabbit, Zero, um, that kind of stuff. And there's a bunch of tools coming out that are doing this and visualize them, and then even report or do metrics on them. But today, to build this, you still need two months of engineering work to actually piece the pieces together. If you're a small shop, 20 machines, use Avix, use Xenos. It works out of the box. But if you're a big shop, you need to do this engineering effort. You need to build a monitoring solution that works for you. So one of the core components of this could be a tool that actually was not written to do this, but can be abused like that. And it's Logstash. Who knows Logstash? OK, two people, three people, cool. So what do you do with your log files? You send them on a centralized log file, log server. How do you query them? How do you give end users, well, developers, visibility on what's going on inside the machines? Do you give them root access, or do you give them a nice, easy, queryable web interface where they can query their data from. How do you filter all your logs? Logstash does all of that. It's a tool that allows you to have on one side a shipper or use our syslog or use other protocols 
Um, in the middle, there's an indexer. It throws stuff in Elasticsearch. And then you have a front end, a web front end, which looks like the next slide. It has a bunch of different inputs. You could use different queues. You can get stuff from files. You can store it in different object stores, um, all that kind of stuff. You can then throw in filters, and it has an ever-growing list of outputs. Collect from anywhere, filter, do something with the data, send it somewhere. And that's how it looks. That's but ugly. Luckily, there's people who build a new front end for that, and it was Kibana. And Kibana is, I've never wanted to spend time on looking at proprietary tools, because there are so many open source stuff around that I can have ages of fun with. But Logstash is a Splunk killer, and Kibana is the front end that makes it happen. So what we have now is a setup which can parse your logs, pull metrics from that, and give your developers or end users an actual interface where they can query the log files they'll generate. And you can point developers to, look, this is the number of times we get that error. Maybe we should look together at that error and fix it. And it's much easier to show them a graph which says, look, at that point in time, we've seen that error so many times, and focus the priority in development on actually getting those errors out there and getting those things fixed. It also helps people to, well, what are they logging? They're just logging everything, logging random blobs, logging error codes which nobody knows about. It gives you an easier access for people to discuss how to improve the actual error logs so that they're usable for people who do the operations. I spent a couple of, well, I don't know how long I worked on it, but if you want to try these tools, there's a GitHub repository which allows you to pull down all the code to configure them. I'm using Puppet to do that. Patrick Dubois has a GitHub repository. We do the same with uh, Chef. And it's basically for Puppet and Logstash and for a couple of other tools we'll discuss. Pull in, git clone, git submodule in it, and Vagrant up. And I'll talk about Vagrant later. But it's easy. If you want to get started, you can pretty much in, in 10 to 15 minutes, you have a full system up and running where you can start sending logs out. So another tool I want to talk about is Graphite. Who likes Cacti? Either everybody is still asleep, or nobody really likes all the other tools I mentioned. Because, well, Cacti is fun. Cacti was a good tool until you had to hire a full-time TBA to manage it. And it's pretty complex to actually get data in there. And that's the power of Graphite. Graphite, if you want to send metrics to it, it's echo some string, some value, and a time step to port 2003 of the server. And that's it. And it will take care of the rest of it. Um, it's really scalable. You can put caching servers in front of it. It really helps you doing stuff. And any metric you think about is a graph. The default dashboard you'll get is a tool that helps you building graphs. Um, you point a metric value in here. It's going to start graphing it. And then you can add more. You can add mathematical functions to that. You can add averages, everything you want to do to build a graph. Does this be a red line, green line? Does it have to be filled? Has to be stacked? All of that stuff. Graphite allows you to do. Are, are you saying that this doesn't suck? <laughs> Depends on your definition of suck. What, what, what don't you like about it? It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of work to actually uh, look at your metrics. Nobody said it doesn't. Nobody said it's not going to be a lot of work. Yeah. Once you get the data into it, it's just there. You can look at it. And with graphite, it's the other way around. From my perspective. Could be, yeah. That could be another way to do it. But we have so many metrics in graphite that we, we don't look at all of them. But what I cannot do with graphite and what I can do with what I cannot do with cacti, what I can do with graphite is tell a developer to look, here's an API. Build your own graph, build your own URL, map them together, and make them visible. And that's the power. Um, and that's a power where you get back feedback from the developers. 
because they want to see how service X, service I, and the CPU usage map together. And they can actually build that graph within five minutes by just generating one URL string. And that's the point where I just want to go to. And that's the power, really. So they can start building dashboards. They can start building stuff which you put in the middle of your lunchroom and where you show the number of concurrent customers you are getting and the number of people who are actually bringing revenue. And there's a lot of tools today which are integrating with Graphite, which are not integrating with Cacti because they don't use that anymore. Tools like StatsD, which actually gets in just a stamp, just an entry, and it counts the number of entries it gets, flushes them to StatsD. Uh, people are using CollectD to get operational systems metric and send those to Graphite using the Carbon Crop plugin. GMX trans basically get all your GMX metrics, throw them directly at Graphite. Um, tools like that. And then there's people who are building dashboards because Graphite is great at taking a metric, making a URL out of it, but it's not really great at actually displaying them. There's tools like Tattle and GDash, which allow you to do a lot more. So these are just a bunch of random metrics. But if you can get this auto-cycling, if you can build pages specifically for these type of end users, they're interested in those metrics. It's a matter of just small configuration files, easy to build from a configuration management system, and you can build these kind of dashboards in minutes, which is a lot less trivial with other tools. But it is the Unix way of thinking, like small functional tools which can be used to achieve goal. Um, same as with Logstash, um, there's Puppet modules, there's boxes on the internet which you can download which will build you a box in little but no time. So, culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. This is an open source conference. We, we're used to share our code. But when I was starting to talk about the stuff I did over a decade ago, I could talk about open mosaics, I could talk about how I was building infrastructure, but I could not always show the actual code that did that. Um, we had to use tools like SourceForge to public our stuff. It was awesome back then, but if you look at it now, SourceForge was really not usable. For, for me, even having had how-tos and documents being translated in word languages like Chinese and Russian, which I couldn't read, but getting the forced pull request on a GitHub repository was so much more satisfying than all those other things. You get a lot of more people contributing to your code because it can just look into it, make some small change, and get it back in there. And then you can decide what it's in there. The whole workflow we have now by using Git is so much easier. Uh, and I think it actually accelerated adoption of open source because it's so easy now. There's a lot of big organizations today who talk about how do you manage your infrastructure. I know 2005, I was talking about doing large-scale Xen deployments, and I saw the Google guy sitting in the back. Yeah, yeah, this, this might be interesting, yeah. And they come to you during breaks, and they talk to you, and you say, yeah, well, what about you guys? How do you guys work? Ah, we can't discuss that. What do you mean you can't discuss it? Nah, we can't discuss that. Fast forward five years, and pretty much every big organization from Facebook over Spotify over Prezi, all of them are talking about how they run their operations, how they do it, which problems they have, why they make certain decisions, why Booking.com is putting stuff in production every day, how they deal with failure. Those talks are happening. People are sharing their experiences. And that's new to me. And that's really, well, it's not new to me anymore, but that's really helpful because you get to hear how not to do it much earlier. You don't have to make all the mistakes yourself. And um, sharing also in the format of DevOps days, the, the fact that you do open spaces where it's not just one guy talking to a bunch of people sitting there and um, parsing their lunch, but actually contributing back to the discussion, that is also a lot more interesting to me. So yeah. Now, if I'm building software and if I'm helping developers out, I also want to have them something. 
how many times are you running into an organization where they're doing development on Windows machines? They are doing testing on some local servers with weird storage setups, and they're throwing stuff in production on Amazon. So three completely different environments. Setups where the developer has MySQL running on Windows, there's a MySQL version on the box in testing, if they even if testing, and there's in production a totally different version of MySQL with different language settings, and they expect that software to work. On the other hand, you cannot expect every single developer to have the skills to set up a platform identical as the one in production. But you want to be able to actually give them something which is really reproducing production. So you want to build an environment where they can change configurations in the platform and where you can give them responsible to certain parts of that, but where they're not really have to. So it should be a shared code base. Both the application code and the infrastructure code should be something both of you can work on together and where you can find each other's bugs and each other's issues. And there's tools to help you doing that. And my favorite tool to build a reproducible infrastructure for a developer is Vagrant. Um, Vagrant is nothing more than today an abstraction layer for VirtualBox. And oops, as much as I hated VirtualBox in the beginning, all the bad stuff about VirtualBox is taken away by the easiness of using Vagrant. Um, it integrates well with different configuration management tools. So all the code I write for building up production, I'm going to reuse exactly the same code for building a box my developers are going to use for building a staging environment, for building the testing environment. It's the same code base. It's the same exact configuration. And if a developer says, no, I want to have some change in my SQL cache, he can try that cache on his local box. And if it's actually working, we're going to propagate that through to production. It's small, it's portable. It means that you reproduce a full environment you want to build. And it means you're not shipping big, fat virtual machine images anymore. No, you're shipping a code base. You're shipping a, Git, shipping a GitHub repository. And in, in the, the way we work, certainly, there's three trees in that repository. There's the Vagrant configuration file. There's the Puppet or Chef code to, to build the box to set up the infrastructure it needs. And then there's the actual source code of the developer. The developer can use it. You can use it for testing. And uh, Patrick Dubois has a use case where he actually had salespeople taking the latest versions from Git, building those, and showing their customers what they could get with the same code base on a laptop. So it's sharing code. It's sharing stuff between people. Um, a Vagrant file is a really small Ruby config file. I know some people don't like Ruby, but nobody knows this is a Ruby config file, which defines um, host name, type of box, um, IP address, and what code to run. In this case, it's an example of how I set up a MongoDB test cluster, and it has Puppet Manifest, Puppet Code, two machines, and when you boot up those two machines, you get a fully working Puppet uh, MongoDB box. The examples I gave before for uh, Graphite and Logstash, they basically are the same. You have a config file in there, it's all in the Git repositories. You boot up the box, Vagrant init, Vagrant up, provision, and you're going, well, it's running. At the end of the day, you say down, you don't want to work on that project anymore, you do destroy, it doesn't eat up any disk space. The only thing you have to ship to the other users is a Git repository. It's easy, it's awesome. Um, Oops, too quick. So yeah, what's the other thing we share with developers? <laughs> Sushi, that's the other thing we share a lot. Um, I talked a lot about tools. I talked a lot about stuff which can help you to start, to get a conversation going. But there's one big tool which I forgot. Which one? I mentioned Ansible. Dash.
Nobody? No, the, the biggest tool I forget, well, the biggest tool I didn't mention yet is basically you guys. Because it's still all about conversation. It's about getting off your share and going to talk to the developer and showing the metrics and get a discussion started on why are you asking me today to get this stuff in production tomorrow? Why didn't you talk to me like three weeks ago when you first had that stupid ID? Because we already ran into that stupid ID 20 times and we could have figured out a better one together. And that's something we still have to do. We still have to start a conversation ourselves. It's still the human being that has to stand up and solve the problem. Machines are not going to do this for us. And that's basically the biggest message I have. It, it, it is about culture. It is about not hiding in your corner. It is about getting the conversation started. And the biggest tool is still you. So, a bunch of links. Uh, these slides are already up on SlideShare. I'll post links later today. Questions? Yes. They can put it there if they want to. I'll point them to the slides. Yeah. Building a new virtual machine every time isn't so. So I well, I. No. No, it's not quicker. Um, I'd show you, but I have VMs up and running in less than a minute. And the thing is, I'd say I'd show you, but then I'm cheating. Because that laptop, which is a week old, has 8 gigs of RAM and a 250 gig of SSD. So it is bleeding fast. It actually is less than 30 seconds to boot up a new VM. But even on my old laptop, it was I didn't even mention. It was, you boot them up once in the morning and you do Vagrant provision all over the day. You keep developing on the virtual machines. Even with a slow disk with four gigs of memory, I had five to six VMs up and running all the time. It is about giving them the appropriate amount of memory. Um, and it really, it, you think it's heavy, but it isn't. It's really not that much power you need. But I, I could show it on this laptop, but I'd be cheating because that's a really, it's a one week old machine. So it's going to be vagrant up. Oh, there we go. Yeah, cool. You are up till today still stuck. Mitchell is working on alternatives. Mitchell is doing different stuff. And Dag is going to say he's going to do the same with Ansible. Um, But he's confusing tools, because I say you can do the same with Puppet, and it's about configuring the machines. It's not about the VM management. I can do the same with Puppet. But that's not the point I was about to make. The point is you need to have somebody with a shared code base, which is something which you can reuse with developers, which is something which you can give to everybody, which they can use. And VirtualBox is one tool. And there's hopefully other tools out there that do the same. More questions? OK. Yeah? Uh, just one, one more. As a DevOps, how, how do you that doesn't exist. There's no such person. Every company that hires DevOps, yeah. they're doing it wrong. OK. Um, so, so, so rephrase your question. Um, how, how do you, as, as ops, would, would manage uh, the 
developers using your EC2 API, how do you kind of keep uh, uh, keep tabs on uh, uh, on that? How, what would you advise to the developers? How do you limit the use of the uh, VMs, or, or what, what are you? I'm not, not sure what you mean, but the thing about having a shared code base means you having both responsibilities. So if a developer screws up, he is the guy who's getting paged up in the morning or at night, and he will do that once. Just like systems people, when they screw up, they will do that once, except if they're stupid. Um, but it's about building trust and giving responsibilities and not just expecting the other guy to just do it. So how can they screw up your complete Amazon setup if they're not careful, if they're not building in tests, which is why we have a tool like Jenkins in place. There's tests being written. Sure, they can screw up. All right. Well, I'll uh, post links to the slides and thank you.